This is my friend Aaron Lipkin, all the way from Israel. And this is, how shall I describe Daniel? This is the chief graphic designer for Prophecy Watchers. A godsend, a, a talented, gifted, true believer. Who, uh, he tells me all the time his job is to make us look good. But I got to tell you a story. We're, uh, and I, Daniel's up here for a reason. We were in Israel a couple years ago with Aaron and Daniel. And we were at a really, really fascinating, interesting archaeological site that was a moving, moving place. The problem was it was cold and cloudy and rainy and windy. And we had about 50 people on this tour group. And as much as we enjoyed the lecture Aaron was providing, we were all just wanted to leave because it was so cold and the wind was blowing and all the girls had to run to the bathroom. And, and so we're just sitting there and thinking, can we just get out of here? So as we closed and got ready to leave, Aaron asked Daniel to pray. With God as my judge, when Daniel started to pray, the wind stopped, the sun came through the clouds, it got very, very quiet. <laughs> and I know you're supposed to close your eyes when you're praying, but we all just looked at each other like, are you watching what's going on here? Anyway, we were in a special place. Aaron goes to a lot of special places. Uh, it's kind of a hidden treasure. I, I call him the, uh, the drone meister because he takes these drones into places no one has ever gone before. So maybe we should call you the Star Trek eschatologist. <laughs> Live long and prosper. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Wow. Uh, Aaron is, is a terrific friend. He's a uh, treasure for his nation, and um, I'm just honored to be here with him and to introduce him to you. Aaron lives east of the Green Line. He lives in the, in the West Bank. Aaron is a settler. He's an Israeli settler, okay? But he loves the land of Israel. He loves the history of the Bible. I'm sure he'll tell you a lot about it. His mission, part of his mission, is to validate the Bible, and I think he does that successfully. And I hope you enjoy this presentation. This place he's going to show you and talk about, you do talk about Argamon, right? Also. Also. Uh, we went there on that tour, and it's, it's remarkable. And if you ever get a chance to go, you know, please do. Ladies and gentlemen, Aaron Lipkin. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Daniel. Um, I'll introduce myself. Uh, um, I, like, I like that people talk about myself, so I'll, I'll talk about myself as well. Um, I was born and raised in Jerusalem. Um, I'm married. I have five children. Uh, Esther, Etty, my wife, uh, you might have seen her sitting by the table. Uh, I'm the son of Avi Lipkin. I'm sure you all know. Uh, I had the privilege of living at my father's house, escorting him uh, to churches since I was 16 years old. Uh, I had such an amazing experience in my life that many other Israeli Jews have never experienced in their lives. And I'm so thankful to my, to my dad and to God for allowing this uh, to happen. Um, I, I also have a travel agency. Um, unfortunately, most of the Bible believers that come to the land of Israel uh, do not visit the biblical heartland of Israel. Um, and there are many reasons for that, but my travel agency makes it a point to bring people to Hebron, Bethel, Shiloh, Mount Gerizim, Mount Ebal, all the places that people that come to Israel really want to see, uh, we bring them there. Um, and uh, and I'm, I'm really attached to the area I live in. I live in Samaria, the biblical heartland of Israel. Um, at first, when I moved there from Jerusalem in the year 2000, I didn't really understand where I lived. Um, we, liked, <clears throat> we liked the village. Uh, my wife, uh, when we came in, she saw the flowers, the gardens, and she's like, that's where I want to live. And what my, wife's do, what my wife do, I say, I do. Uh, 
And, uh, and, and so we went and we, and we lived and became residents of Ofra. And after five or six years, I started understanding that I was really living in a, in a biblical volcano. I was smack in the middle of where everything happened. When I traveled from Jerusalem to Ofra, where I live, I passed by where Jonathan fought the Philistines with a servant. Uh, I continue on, and, and on the right-hand side is Jake, the site where Jacob dreamt the dream of the ladder at Bethel. I continue on, and I, I, I pass by Shiloh, where the tabernacle was. This is a half an hour drive north of Jerusalem, and it's just, it's just amazing. I love the Bible. Since I was a kid, I read the Bible, and, and I believed in the Bible, and I, I, I looked at the biblical heroes as something that I want to be like, um, and, and I believed in God wholeheartedly. And I remember in elementary school, we had Bible school, and I was so good at Bible, at Bible class, um, I, I knew all the answers. I always spoke about parallels in other places where all my other classmates were just silent. They didn't know what I was talking about. Unfortunately, in high school, when I started attending Bible school there in Jerusalem, my teacher told me that the Bible is a fairy tale that the stories never happened, Exodus never happened, Joshua, Moses. And mind you, this is in Jerusalem, in the land of Israel, in the Holy Land, in a Jewish school. And I spoke about it in length in my, on my lecture on Thursday, so I won't, I won't talk too much about that, but obviously there's, a gen, there's an agenda behind this. Uh, your children in colleges and in schools are being educated not to believe in God, not to believe in the Bible. And they are in a, in, in a, in a warfare uh, between what, they're, what they were educated at home and what they're educated in school and colleges. There's an agenda in the academic world against God and against the Bible. And it's important to acknowledge that and understand that. Because when you do, you're able to prepare the weapons of defense and the weapons of attack. And that is the mission I have in my life to bring the knowledge of archaeology that proves the veracity of the Bible to Bible believers, so they are able to face those challenges. The other reason why this is being taught in colleges and schools is because the science of archaeology uh, couldn't find proof for many years for the biblical stories. Um, and there's a whole school in archaeology, the minimalist school, that tries to show that the Bible is not true or inaccurate. Um, thank God, 1967, Israel liberates Judea and Samaria, which was occupied by Jordan, and suddenly the biblical heartland of Israel is open for research. You start having archaeologists going in to the land, and one of those archaeologists is Professor Adam Zertal from the Haifa University, professor of archaeology. And what he did with his uh, colleagues was to make a survey of Samaria and the Jordan Valley. Now, what you see in front of you is a map of Israel. The areas of the Jordan Valley, which are marked in front of you right now from the northern tip of the Dead Sea all the way up to the Galilee Sea, just a bit south of the Galilee Sea, and the area of Samaria, which is not marked here, um, and I'll use the laser beam just to show where it is. This Samaria is right here. This is really smack in the center of the country, okay? Uh, for you guys, Samaria is over here. Samaria and the Jordan River were unresearched zones in archaeology. And uh, Professor Zertal and his crew start surveying, looking at the land, looking for pottery, looking for uh, pieces of clay, anything that would, would, uh, would say that there was, this was an ancient place. And you know, in the United States, history is 200, 300, 400. In Israel, everything is in the thousands. So, so you know, you're looking at the land and you're looking at the pottery, and archaeologists can take pottery, pieces of pottery, and can date the site where the pottery was found by the pottery. Okay, so for instance, you find Persian pottery, so you know that this is from a certain date and time. You find Greek pottery, so you know where, that that's a Greek site, and so on and so forth. 
Um, so they survey the Jordan Valley and Samaria, and what they're finding is amazing findings. Okay, we spoke about Joshua's altar on Thursday on Mount Ebal, an amazing discovery that changed Professor Zertal. Okay, I, I remember being with Daniel and Bob in Jerusalem at the hotel. Professor Zertal came to the group, to the Prophecy Watchers group, and gave them a lecture. And before he gave them the lecture, I, um, I introduced him as the born-again archaeologist because he was, he was a non-believing, left-wing liberal Jew who learned archaeology uh, in, in the non-believing school. And suddenly, he found Joshua's altar, and his life flipped. He was literally born again. Okay? So, so that was an amazing discovery. And there's a book that he wrote, The Nation Born, uh, again, one of those weapons against non-believers. A professor of archaeology says the Bible is true, and that's amazing. So uh, they continue, they survey the Jordan Valley, and they're finding important stuff. They're finding suddenly a, 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 an, an invasion of, uh, of Israelite site from nowhere, okay? You, you survey, you see that in the late Bronze Age, the area of the Jordan Valley is empty, and suddenly, in the early Iron Age, which is thought to be the time when the Israelites entered the land, hundreds and hundreds of sites appear from, from anywhere, historically, from anywhere. How do you explain that? We know how to explain that. But, but, but for Adam Zertal, this was a big surprise. Uh, again, this is the area of the Jordan Valley. You see the, the Jordan River. Uh, unfortunately, today, uh, because of water, uh, being pumped out uh, from the Galilee Sea. It's uh, not as big as the rivers that you have here in the United States, but still, it's the Jordan River, uh, and uh, with all the emotional and biblical feelings that we have towards this river. And suddenly, they start finding other stuff in their, in their survey, okay? They, they go from the Jordan Valley into Samaria, and suddenly, they bump into an Israelite site. They see the pottery is Israelite, but it doesn't look like a residential place. It doesn't look like the camps that they saw in the Jordan Valley. This is a, an elliptical shape. Looks like a kidney, maybe a footprint. And this shape is divided into um, compounds, internal compounds. You have, you have like different parts inside. At first, Professor Zertal didn't know what it was. Um, the Arabs called this site Unuk, uh, which, is, which means in Arabic a chain of pearls. Um, but that's, that's, what, that's what he had. He knew it, it was Israelite. He knew that he didn't know what it was. <laughs> and he continued on surveying. This is a sketch of the footprint of Unuk and Tirza. Again, you can see clearly uh, the archaeological sketch of the different parts of the foot, and something that resembles a, an altar at the end of the footprint. Okay? Um, he continues on, and he arrives at Mount Ibal. Okay? We spoke again on Thursday about Mount Ibal. Uh, he found the altar, but he also finds something around the altar. He finds a, another kidney or footprint-shaped uh, enclosure. And again, it's Israelite. The same pottery that they found in the Jordan Valley in the camps, they find in Unuk, the footprint that we just saw, saw and the same pottery on Mount Ibal. But this time, they know what it is because we have a footprint and we have inside the footprint an Israelite altar built by Joshua. So Adam Zertal understands that this footprint, this Israelite footprint, is not a residential area. It's not a, 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 an army camp. It is, it is a worshipping site, an ancient worshipping site of the Israelites. Okay? We know it's, we know it's Israelite. But the fact that the altar of Joshua is inside this enclosure 
shows that this is indeed a worshipping site. Okay, here is a sketch of the Ibal footprint. Again, you see a, sh a footprint shape. You see that there is a division inside the footprint between uh, the different uh, areas, and we have an altar, okay? Very similar to Unuk. They continue on the survey. In the Jordan Valley, they find what is probably the most amazing footprint you'll ever see, okay? This is huge. This is a football court. Amazing, just, just amazing. We've been there with the Prophecy Watchers Tour in 2015. Uh, and again, Professor Zertal and his crew arrive here and they're amazed. They see another Israelite site um, that didn't serve, you know, civilian day-to-day um, -day life duties, but rather a worshipping site. And this footprint has very interesting attributes to it. First of all, as we saw, like the rest of the, the other footprints, we see that there is a a, an area inside, and there's an, an, another area inside of that area. Professor Zertal starts measuring the inner area and sees that it's in the, the dimensions that will be able to fit the tabernacle inside of it. Uh, he sees that the entrance is from east to west. Okay, so suddenly things come together. This is the special thing about Professor Zertal. Um, in the, in the 19th century, Christian archaeologists looked at the Bible, they saw Bethel, they saw Shiloh, they went to the places they thought were the same places, and they dug there. And then you had the, the, the new school of thought in archaeology that didn't believe in the Bible and God, and they just said, you know, let's push the Bible aside. We'll just do archaeology. We'll just dig. We won't look at the Bible. What Professor Zertal did is a combination of the two. He started out with archaeology. He got to a certain site, he researched that site, and to, un to better understand what that site is, he opened the Bible. And then he got a complete picture. And this is exactly what started to happen immediately after Mount Ibal, the understanding that this was a, as the, as the archaeologists call it, a cult site, a, a place of worship an Israelite place of worship. Um, another interesting thing about this footprint is that it has a procession road, okay? When you look at the walls here, you see two stones that are connected to each other. But at a certain point, there is a floor and it opens up to a procession road that people can walk between the two stones, the two walls, the two rows of walls, and walk around the footprint. Okay, so this is interesting. If there is a procession road, then the worshipping ceremony that was there uh, included going around. Okay? Another picture of the Argaman footprint after the dig. Um, another interesting thing is that you will see that the Israelites, when they built this site 3,300 years ago, it's amazing to say that uh, number, we don't even grasp it, um, they built it right by a slope. This is a mountain slope. So you would be able to sit, to seat uh, hundreds of thousands of people that would be watching what's going on inside the footprint. Now, I've been there many times, and you know, the footprint is very interesting, but suddenly, after so many times, you start looking at the footprint, and you look at the slope, and, and you're going to, you, you go on the slope, and you sit on the slope, looking over the footprint, and suddenly you look forward, and what do you see in front of you? You see the mountains of Jordan, and you see the Yabok Pass, okay? What happened in the Yabok Pass? Do you remember? Jabok in the Bible, in English, Jabok. Jacob, very good. Jacob went back from Lavan, his uncle, 
he fought the angel at the Jabok Pass. He became Israel. That was, that was the name that was given to him. And he passed through the Jabok River into the land. So you start connecting the dots. The Israelites are sitting on that slope, watching over this footprint, but also looking at the place where Jacob, their patriarch, came into the land, just like they did. It's very interesting. Um, this is a, another picture of the footprint. And obviously, I have a surprise at the end of the PowerPoint presentation, but you probably know what it is. Uh, but we'll continue. Um, here is a, a rehearsal. <laughs> they built the tabernacle the same sizes inside the Argaman footprint to really see that it fits, and it, it really looks interesting. This is the procession road that I spoke about. This is the heel of the footprint, so you can see very clearly that people can walk in a circle going around. They continue on surveying the Jordan Valley, and guess what? Another one. Okay, another footprint. Israelite, kidney-shaped, footprint-shaped. They don't know <laughs> how to, how, it's, 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 the, it's the fourth one. I mean, it's, this is like, this is something that's re repeating itself. Um, and the interesting thing is that here, the procession road goes all around the footprint unlike Argaman, where it goes only at a certain point around. Um, here is a picture of the footprint from the slopes of the mountain that are right by that footprint. Again, the same thing. We have a footprint, and we have a natural amphitheater that the, the Israelites used in order to look over at the footprint and at Jabok. Here is the picture of archaeologist drawer Ben Yosef uh, and the procession road. You can see very clearly this is a like much closer look at a segment of the procession road. Uh, we're not talking about tall walls. This is a very low wall, uh, but something that would very clearly mark the place where you have to walk around. Another footprint, Masua footprint. This was unfortunately the, ruined by the Israeli army because of some infrastructure work. Um, you know, in, in, again, in the United States, if you have a 3,000 year old site, you would immediately have a museum above it, air conditioned, and, and you'd, have, you'd have to pay a lot of money. Here in Israel, the army's like, ah, 3,000 years old, and so, yeah, so unfortunately, major parts of this footprint were, uh, were destroyed. Professor Zertal is watching all of these footprints, and what does he do? He opens the Bible. And very interestingly, he starts connecting the dots. If the ceremony at the footprint was to walk around, then that, that's really interesting because how many people here know Hebrew or just, you know, a bit of Hebrew? How do you say holiday in Hebrew? Chag, okay? It's an Israeli. I always say Chag, Chag Sameach, happy, happy holiday, Chag Pesach, you know, Passover. Chag literally means in Hebrew, to circle. Now, we don't think about that, but now when you find the, the place where the Israelites worshipped and you see that they have procession roads, and so the ceremony was to go around, then Chag has a literal meaning, to go around in circles. Now, we just celebrated the Feast of Tabernacles in Israel, and I was in the synagogue in Israel with the four species that are commanded in the Bible, and we walked around the, the platform, the central platform. Why are we doing that? Tradition? No, th there's a reason for that. Okay, you start to understand it. Got some more surprises for you. But 
let's summarize where we are for now. We have five footprints, Yafit, Masua, and Argaman, which are in the Jordan Valley. And I just want to point out another thing. Most of the camps, the Israelite camps that were found by the Israelites, by, by Professor Zertal and his crew, were in the area of the Jabok Pass and Adam. Now, for us as Bible believers, this brings up a question mark. Where did Joshua cross? Joshua and, and the Israelites crossed at Jericho. Now, Jericho is to the south. It's not in this area. It's close by, but it's not in this area. Yet, we see that the major influx of Israelite invasion was in the Jabok area. And Professor Zertal and his crew find the next footprint at Unuk, the Tirza Valley going up to Samaria, and the last one being on Mount Ibal around the altar inside Samaria. For Professor Zertal, this was, this was very interesting because it showed that the Israelites entered the land from the Jabok Pass into Samaria. So how do you, how do you work with Jericho and what happened there? So Professor Zertal didn't go into that because that's too dangerous in the academic world in Israel to go into that dispute. I would venture and say the following. The Bible is not a history book. The Bible describes historical events, but the Bible has a certain agenda, and that agenda is an educational agenda. It's for us to believe in God, uh, to be faithful to God, to obey God, and the, the, the purpose of the book of Joshua is the conquest of the land of Canaan. And so many things happened in the entrance to the land, but for the Bible it was important to talk about the conquest of Jericho, the conquest of Ai. So who passed in Jericho? The army, okay? The people that were supposed to fight. But we read in the book of Joshua that the water of the Jordan River didn't stop in Jericho. It stopped at the Jabok Pass. It stopped at Adam. So I would venture and say that Jericho's invasion was a military invasion. And the civilians, the women, the children, the elders, they passed at the Jabok Pass, just like Jacob. So archaeology gives us a complete picture, okay? Not just the military wing at Jericho, but the whole wing, including the civilian wing. Now, Professor Zertal is asking himself, these footprints are big monuments. They have to appear somewhere in the Bible. Now, if they are worshiping sites, I have to look at the Bible for worshiping sites. Now, where did the Israelites worship the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob before Shiloh? before Mount Ibal, at Gilgal. Okay, this is from Samuel. Uh, sorry, this is from Joshua. And those 12 stones which they took out of Jordan, the Joshua pitch in Gilgal. So Gilgal becomes an important place. Now, which Gilgal is this? Okay, we know that Gilgal is, is Jericho, right? It's near Jericho. I remember reading the Bible all my life. There was one place, Gilgal, and it was right by Jericho. What else happens in Gilgal? Uh, the crowning of, the, of King Saul, okay? Sacrificing. This is a worshiping site, a place of worshiping, a place of crowning the king. It's also a place of getting ready for war, okay? This is a, a, a camp where you, you come, you worship to God before going out to war. Samuel, walking around the land of Israel, he goes from Bethel to Gilgal to Mitzpah and back. So Gilgal is a place of judging, of judgment, of justice. Now, of course, in the Bible, 
We're not talking about the high court in Israel, the high court in, in the United States. We're talking about a place of justice, of godly justice, a, ju a place where you have prophets. This is a divine place. All of these places, all of these things, these actions happen in Gilgal. So, we all thought that Gilgal was one place, right, in Jericho. But again, suddenly, you're looking at the Bible, and it's not, it's not so clear that Gilgal is just Jericho. Okay? When Moses tells the Israelites to go to Mount Tibal and Mount Gerizim, he says, are they not beyond the Jordan, west of the road, toward the going down of the sun, in the land of the Canaanites who live in the Arabah, opposite Gilgal, beside the Oak of Moreh. Okay, so we have a Gilgal, which is in, 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 in central Samaria. It's not near Jericho. Okay, so it, we have at least one place that is not Jericho. Okay, we have, obviously, Jericho, the place where the Israelites came in, and encamped in Gilgal. That we knew. But wait, there's another Gilgal. Okay, a point on the border between the tribe of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin. So there are at least three distinct Gilgals in different places in Israel. And so Professor Adam Zartal says to himself, Wait a second. If Gilgal is not a name of a place, then it is a name of a use. It, it's a name of, of, of a place that serves a certain target, a certain reason. That it's a place of worship. So he says, I need to check my theory. I'm a scientist. I need, I need to know if I'm right or wrong. Gilgal Jericho was not found. Gilgal Elon More, maybe, we'll talk about that in a minute. But there's the third Gilgal on the border between Judah and Benjamin. I kind of know where that is. So Professor Zertal requests satellite footage to be sent to him of the area where he thought the border between Judah and Benjamin went through. He didn't say anything to his students or colleagues. He got the satellite photos. And guess what he saw? <laughs> he didn't say anything to his colleagues, and he said, just said to them, Let's go and survey that area. I think it's interesting. <laughs> so he describes in his book, The Footsteps of God, which has not been published yet. I have the only Hebrew copy. And Daniel Wright, where's Daniel? You start to, need to start translating it. People want it. He tells his colleagues and students, let's go there, see what's going on there. And they start walking in the area. They come with their Jeep, and they suddenly they see another footprint. And they see Israelite clay, Israelite pottery. Oh my God, another sight. Okay, so this is, this, this we proved scientifically that the footprint, Professor Zertal proved scientifically that these footprints are Israelite Gilgals, worshiping sites. Okay, so this is, this is fascinating. Now we have to understand why a footprint. Why? why? Why in the shape of a footprint? Where do the Israelites come from? They come from Egypt. They've been there for centuries. Okay, the, the, the Jewish sources talk in length about the Egyptian pagan uh, uh, influence on the Israelites. Okay, but they were affected also culturally and in many ways. 
let's, let's look at the Egyptian sources. Amun-Ra caused you to trample the princess of the Syria-Palestine, and I spread them out under at your feet throughout the foreign countries. Okay? We know that the Egyptians saw Pharaoh as God, and the legs or the feet of Pharaoh had a spiritual, mystical uh, importance to show that the enemies were defeated by Pharaoh, they were under his feet. Want to see a picture? Okay, here's Pharaoh, and, and you know, he's hugging someone, but under his feet are enemies. Now, putting it on a picture is not enough in Egypt. Okay, you need to really put the enemies to, to sketch them on your sandals and literally f step on them every day, multiple times, okay? <laughs> so, you see the bows representing the nations of the world and, and who's stepping on them? Pharaoh. Pharaoh has control over them. Now, in the Arab world, that it's still, still, still there. Remember Gaddafi, the, the, the leader of Libya? This is the Arab Spring. They still do it. Okay? Now, so let's talk about the importance of the foot or the sole of the foot uh, in the Bible. Okay? If we, if we know that this, is, this might, be, might be an important shape and for, for some reason it repeats itself, what, where does the foot appear in the Bible? So, it comes up in a number of connections. Ownership of territory, existence of the people, victory on enemies, and the symbol of God. Okay, let's see a few verses. Moses swore in that day, surely the land on which your foot made its way will become an inheritance for you and your sons. I'm warning you, from after this lecture, everywhere you see foot in the Bible, suddenly it's going to, to, to I, know, I know what they mean, I know what they mean. <laughs> Do not contend with them, for I will not give to you any of their land, not so much as the sole of a foot can tread on for is in a possession to Esau, I have given Mount Seir. Okay? Let's continue. Moses swore in that day, Surely the land on which your foot made its way will become an inheritance for you and your sons. Do not contend with them, for I will not give to you any of their land, not so much as I wrote. I, okay, I read that already. Okay, the second group is the existence of the people. Let's see some, some phrases about that. I will no longer allow Israel's foot to wander out of the land I give to their fathers. I will not again make the feet of the Israelites leave the land I assigned to your forefathers. And among these nations you will find no ease, and there will be no rest for the sole of your foot. And Hashem will give you there an anguished heart and cried out eyes and a dried throat. This is a negative, a negative way of seeing the foot. Uh, victory upon enemies. You knew how that David, my father, could not build a house to the name of the Lord his God for the wars which were about him on every side until the Lord put them under the soles of his feet. He made nations prostrate beneath, prostrate be, beneath us and people under our feet. And kings shall be your nursing fathers and queens your nursing mothers. They shall bow down to you with their face toward your feet. The next group is the symbol of the God. The glory of Lebanon shall come to you. The fear, the, okay, I'm sorry, I'm in Israeli, so forgive me. The f fear, the pine, and the box trees together to beauty the place of my sanctuary and the place of my feet I shall glory. Exalt Hashem our God, prostrate at his footstool. Holy is he. Another interesting thing. The feasts 
in Hebrew are called, in Hebrew, regalim. Now, as a kid in Israel, when I said the word regalim, meaning the holidays, I thought that it comes from the word to go up with your feet to the holy temple because you didn't have any cars or trucks as a kid. That's what I thought. But suddenly, Professor Zertal says, regalim means feet. Regel, holiday, means in Hebrew, foot. Okay? So, so, so where does this come from? Now we know. Okay? The, the footprint shape, the holy place that you would go up to was a foot. And so we have another definition. Aliyah la regel in Hebrew, which means to go to the holy place, to do pilgrimage. But it literally means to go up to the foot. Now, these are things that, that <laughs> we, we did not know until Professor Zertal found these footprints. So, the next stage is to try and identify the footprints that we found in the Bible. Now, that's everything I'm going to say now from this point on was not uh, lectured by Adam Zertal. It's only written in his book. And again, Daniel, you start, need to start. <laughs> but but uh, this, is, this is something that, that, that's really, I've never spoken about this, not in Israel, not in the United States. This is the first time that I'm going to, to talk about what Adam Zertal and how he identified the Gilgals that he found. So, the first Gilgal, Unuk, he believed to be the Gilgal that Moses referred to when he told the Israelites to go to Mount Ibal and Mount Gerizim. Remember the verse I showed you earlier? The distinct place near Elon More is Unuk. The other footprint that Professor Zertal spoke about is Argaman. Now, I have to say something. You guys read the Bible in English, but you all know that the Bible was written in Hebrew. And there's a saying in French, translation is treason, because when you translate, you have to give commentary. You have to explain. So you, 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 sometimes you alter the meaning of the, the verse when you translate it from Hebrew to another language. In Psalm 78, 60, there is a, a historical account, a very, very interesting psalm of itself. One of the verses, verse 60, talks about the destruction of the tabernacle in Shiloh. Now, in English, the verse says, so that he forsook the tabernacle of Shiloh, the tent which he placed among men. The word among men in Hebrew is Adam. Adam can be translated, just like Adam, by the way, it's the same name. Adam is a man, a human being. But Professor Zertal and other Bible scholars say that this is a verse written in parallelism, which means that Shiloh, the name of the place, is parallel to Adam, the name of the place. And Adam is Tel Damya, a city, a biblical city on the eastern bank of the Jordan River at the Jabok Pass. The closest footprint to the Jabok Pass and the village, the city, biblical city of Adam is Argaman. And so Professor Zertal believes that the tabernacle was moved temporarily from Shiloh after the destruction in the book of Samuel to this footprint. Let's summarize. The foot-shaped enclosures shed new light on the beginning of Israel, Israelite cult and religion. Cult is such a word, you know, archaeological word. Worship. Um, 
And then people ask, wait a second, so what about, what's the holiest place? Jerusalem. Okay, we're talking about pilgrimage, going to, up to the temple. What about Jerusalem? Okay. By the way, this is always the reaction. <laughs> City of David, original Jerusalem, Jebusite Jerusalem. Okay, conquered by King David. But who builds the temple? Solomon. Solomon. David purchases the Arvana threshing floor. Threshing floor. Thank you. And, uh, and then this area, Mount Moriah. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not doing this on this uh, screen. I'm really sorry. Uh, City of David. And then later on added Mount Moriah by King Solomon. And we have a footprint. So, amazing discovery. Um, I have to tell you, every time I go to the Argaman footprint, which is my favorite, I just, I, I, I feel so, so amazed uh, and so blessed to live in the land of Israel and to, to touch the, the stones and the walls that were built by my forefathers, my ancestors, and to, to imagine the Levites and the priests walking around this, this, this structure is, is just goosebumps, just goosebumps. And I, and, I, and I also see the Christian tourists that come with, the, with my travel agency, and I, sometimes I take them there, and I actually had a, a pastor that, that, that said, Aaron, you have to take me there. And we went there, and he said, Aaron, you're just going to stand on the slopes. Here's my camera, my video camera. And he started circling the foot. And he said, I want my children to see this. It was so, so moving. So, um, I have to say, I have to tell you the story. I'm, I'm sorry if you're hearing this the second time. But I'm 43 years old. And I'm married to Esther, my beautiful wife, who is a, originally a, a, from a family of Yemenite Jews. Now, Yemenite Jews in Israel are very well known for their, let's say they're very careful with money. <laughs> I'm the spender in the house. So that's one thing they're known for. The other thing they're known for is that they don't celebrate birthdays. You know, I remember going to my mother-in-law, my Yemenite mother-in-law, saying, you know, why don't you celebrate my birthday? And she looks at me and she says, you know, you know who celebrated his birthday in the Bible? I said, who? She said, Pharaoh. <laughs> Pharaoh celebrated that. You want to be like Pharaoh? I said, no, no. <laughs> I don't want to mess up. I don't want to mess with my mother-in-law. But I became 40 three years ago. I came to my wife and said, listen, enough is enough. You need to buy, buy me a present. <laughs> so my wife looks at me and she says, what do you want? I said, well, uh, a drone. <laughs> so she looks at me and she says, how much does that drone cost? And I said, ah, $2,000. So she said, you won't see a penny. <laughs> so I told her, OK, listen, I have to have this drone. Can I crowdfund from my friends? And she said, yeah, do what you want. And I did. I'm going to show you some drone footage that I made of the footprints. Ready? Fasten your seat belts. Let's start with the footprint of Mount Ibal. Okay, this is Samaria. We have a group of tourists from the United States standing right here. 
just to get the dimensions, how big it is. You'll be able to see the altar of Joshua coming up on the right hand of the footprint. Right here. I hope you don't get dizzy and see the altar right here. You guys see the altar? Okay. Argaman, the footprint of Argaman. Now, the good thing about this video that I so successfully took. <laughs> well, I'm so sorry my wife is not here. Um, uh oh. <laughs> Etty, don't disturb me. I'm using the drone footage for important <laughs> stuff here. Okay, so we see the uh, Argaman footprint, and what's good about this photo is that you'll be able to see the slopes of the Israelites where they sat watching the ceremonies happening here on the foot. You see the slopes? Now, another thing that I've noticed when visiting there is that there are three levels for the slopes. Uh, maybe this is the VIP benches <laughs> for the elders, for the important people, and then the families and the children up there. That's me, by the way, and a good Christian friend from Austin. <laughs> One more? Do you want more? Okay, your feet, footprint. Now, uh, since the excavations, uh, floods, flood water have covered much of the foot, so it'll be a bit uh, challenging to notice it from my drone footage, not because I didn't do a good job, but just because of the flood waters. And I'm probably going to do it better the next time. Okay, so what you see here is the foot. You see the squares, the archaeological squares uh, that were excavated by Professor Dror ben Yosef, Dr. Dr. Ben Yosef, and a, a procession road that goes all around the footprint. You want to see the uh, slopes right by this footprint? I don't know how much time I have, but Okay, this is the slopes right by the footprint. And again, I'm going down and then I'm going, you see the archeological excavations at the footprint. And then you see the slopes. This is the VIP benches. <laughs> this is the second porch and this is the upper porch. Now in Argaman, I actually went up, my Christian friend said, Aaron, let's go all the way up to the upper porch. And I said, listen, I'm, I'm 43, it's, it's, it's not hard. He said, I'm, I'm 55, let's go. So we went, we went up there, and we got to the second porch, and I'm like... <laughs> they said, okay, you stay, rest. I don't want you to get a heart attack. And he went up to the third porch. And it was very interesting that all porches look all the way to the footprint without hiding the, 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 uh, the vision from the upper porch. It's really, the Israelites knew what they were doing. They were looking for a place that had a couple of levels looking over Jabuk Pass and at the footprint. And Kabir, on Unuk, Unuk footprint. This is actually a shot taken with a lot of adrenaline in my blood. Um, it's not easy to send away a, an expensive drone so far away above Palestinian Muslim territory. <laughs> Don't tell anyone. I hope, I hope this is not being, not being on the internet. This is the Tirza Valley. Okay? 
This is the valley, the main road from the Jordan Valley into Shechem. If you came from Jordan and you wanted to get to the city of Shechem, the most important city in the land of Israel in biblical times, you had to pass at the Jabok River, like Jacob, and go through the Tirzah Valley, like Jacob. Jacob walked in this valley. I kid you not. This is real stuff. Okay, let's fast forward to see the footprint of Unuk. Is this how you envision Israel? We don't ride camels also, by the way, we, we use cars. Uh, getting closer to the uh, Unuk footprint, um, I started losing control of the drone at a certain point, so I got it back. I couldn't take it all the way down to the footprint. You see that the Palestinians, Palestinians are building farms right by it, but they don't touch the footprint itself because it's an archaeological park. So. I'm really excited about this uh, video, by the way. I think that these footprints are a message, not just to the Israelites and the people back then, 3,000 years ago. The footprint is the ancient flag. You go to the moon, you put the flag of the United States. You conquer Canaan, and you put the flag of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Everywhere you put your foot will be yours. And so the footprint is the ancient Israelite flag of the book of Joshua and the book of Judges. Come to Israel. It's amazing. Thank you. If you want to see another video, while you're standing. This is the city of Shechem. Again, a very dangerous thing to do with your drone, <laughs> but I did it. And you're going to see, this is the uh, city of, the Arab city of Nablus, and now you see on the right, Mount Ibal, on the left, Mount Gerizim. In the middle, the city of Shechem, and we're going to go to ancient Shechem, where Simon and Levi, Simon and Levi, went in to kill some uh, people that did bad things to Dina. If you remember that, these are real stories, and they happen in real places. This is Mount Ibal. I'm sorry, I'm for fast forwarding this. Okay, this is ancient Shechem. We're going down. Now, if you look at the book of Joshua, the, uh, the last chapter, Joshua convenes the Israelites to Shechem. And he does a ceremony just before passing away. And that ceremony, he erects a stone. Okay, would that stone still be around? Of course not. Or will it? Okay, the archaeologists that dug the city of Shechem found a huge, sto huge stone memorial uh, in the temple of Shechem, and you're going to see it in a minute. What you're seeing now, nobody saw. This is really state of the art drone <laughs> video footage. I'm getting in trouble. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, this is the, you see this stone right here? Right in front of the temple of Shechem. And this is the stone that saw so many history, so many wars. The stone that Joshua erected, the stone that saw the Israeli tanks in 1967 liberating the heartland of Israel, and bringing Israel back to Israelite control. Guys, we're done with the lecture. Why are you still here? <laughs> Shalom. See you in Israel.